Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. It is said that Allah has sent 124,000 prophets into the world. The world is split up into many different areas, many different sections, many different temperature zones, many different topographies. There are jungles, there are deserts, there are many different lifestyles within the world. And these prophets came to all of these different areas. The prophets did not bring different messages. They all brought one message. They all brought the message that there is one God and there are no differences among humanity, that there is a unity among all mankind. But one of the things that happened is people began to revere their own particular prophet because prophets came to different people in different languages, their own. And so religions formed around these prophets and we ended up with rituals in each of these religions. And if you look at the different rituals within the formation of the different religions, you might think outwardly from seeing the different rituals that these religions were somehow different. And the truth is that at the essence of all of these religions, there is a unity and there is a sameness. There is an understanding that needs to be followed and that understanding is at the core of all true religions. But religions began to become institutionalized and once they were institutionalized, they began to find things that were important to them other than proclaiming the unity of mankind and the unity of the one God. Things like getting adherence for the religion became very important. Things like getting people to observe the rituals of their religion became very important. Keeping other religions out of their area and stopping other religions from gaining strength became very important. And so people lost sight of the relationship between God and man. And the relationship became between man and religion. If you do A, B, C, D, you are within the protection of the religion. And if you're within the protection of the religion, you are within God's favor. Sufism is different than that. Sufism acknowledges the fact that all these prophets came and acknowledges the fact that all of these prophets represented the one God and brought the message of the one God. And Sufism is an attempt to recreate what it is that the prophets actually brought, which is an understanding of how man can commune with his creator, how man can get to know his creator, how man can enter into reality 
and leave this illusory world. Sufism breaks up the path towards reality and calls it by different names. And when I say breaks up, I mean it has certain steps. Shariat, Tariqat, Hakikat, Marifat, and Sufiyat are steps towards reality. Shariat is a basis for how to act within this world. Now, the illusory world is the temporary world. The real world is the eternal world. So what we are trying to do is focus on the eternal world and leave the temporary world. What this does for us is it makes us on the path of becoming eternal as opposed to being on the path to becoming illusory, on the path to being an illusion, on a path to being reborn into lower and lower forms until one ends up in hell. So what is it that man needs to do? Man needs to begin to understand his relationship with the world and his relationship with God. What is man's relationship to the world? What is man's relationship to God? Why is there a relationship with the world? What's the reason for the relationship with the world? And how does that hinder you from entering into your relationship with God? This body that each of us walks around in is made up of the elements. Allah took a fistful of earth, and from that fistful of earth, he created man. Now, all of the elements that are in the world, in this earth, are in man's body. They may be there in minute forms, but they exist. We are an earthly elemental creation. And <clears throat> within us, there is a piece of flesh on the heart, which is called the Bisman Kai, which is the place where the soul resides. There actually is such a piece of flesh, and this is the internal mosque, and it exists on the heart. This soul was placed there by Allah. He breathed into us this soul, which is a part of his eternal majesty. This exists within me and you and everyone. God gave this gift to everyone. We, for the most part, are unaware of this, and we have spent our time in the elemental world. And in the elemental world, we have interfaced with all of God's creations in the world. And there is enough going on in this elemental world that it can consume our attention for our entire life. There's enough going on that we can have a relationship with so many different things within the world that there can be no time for anything else. And we can enter into the belief system 
that this is a sufficient life, that this is enough for us. Now, this body is subject to many burdens. It's subject to hunger. It's subject to thirst. It's subject to stress. It's subject to old age. It's subject to death. However, if we can find out about the truth of who we are and the reality of who we are, if we can find out and understand ourselves, come to know ourselves, come to know ourselves, our own connection to our creator, then the time span that this body has disappears and time disappears for us. And then death disappears for us and life and death just become one continuum. There is no separation. There is no difference. What separates them for us and what puts us in a situation where we fear death is our being involved with desire and time. And because we're involved with desire and time, we're attached to this physical world, to this elemental world, to this illusory world. And why is it called illusory? Because it's temporary, because it's not eternal. So to move from illusion to reality is the object of Sufism. So what does the Sheikh teach you in the study of Sufism? What does the Sheikh try to convey to the, to the dervish, uh, to the murshid, to the student as he lectures to them or as he discourses to them? He tries to convey what are the necessary qualities what are the necessary ways? What are the things that you have to do to shift your life from a life that is mired in illusion to a life that is on the path to reality, on the path to the truth, on the path to knowing Allah, on the path to Anil Haq, to where you actually become reality. And when you become reality, you've lost the sense of the body and you've given up the burdens of the body because that shift happens where you move without time, where you move without being subject to that which keeps you in the illusory world. If you have flowers and you look at the flower and you'll notice that the flower within a week or two at the most will die and dissipate. However, if you can take that flower and get the essential oils out of that flower, and get the essence out of that flower, you can make a perfume out of that flower, which will last a long time. By taking it and getting the essence out of it, understanding the inner, most precious, most essential part of it. Well, within us, there is also this essence, this essential, most pure part, which we have to be able to get 
out of ourselves, which we have to be able to dive into to know the truth of. But at the same time we're doing that, there are all of the qualities of the world that surround us, that we come into contact with, and that have influence on us. When you go to a supermarket and you buy food, you bring it home, you cut it up, and you roast it, or you fry it, or you bake it, until it gets to the point where you consume it. You chop it up into different ways. These qualities in the world, like anger and jealousy and hastiness and hate and dissension and separations, if they exist within us, become part of our being. And what they do to us is they tear us up. They chop us up. They put us into little pieces and then they bake us and fry us and put us in a position where we can't find the truth. People who have hate towards others think that they are projecting that hate outwardly. But in truth, it's residing within them and is affecting them internally. And it's that way with every one of the satanic qualities. If you carry them, they have an effect on you. They destroy you internally. And they keep you from moving forward on the path towards the truth. They stop you because they are the veils that keep the true qualities of eternity, the qualities that belong Allah from being able to enter you. Allah placed us here and we have been given the freedom to elect the manner in which we move forward. We have to have a vision for what it is we want to accomplish in this world. We either want to conquer the world or we want to conquer ourselves. So our focus is either outside of ourselves or inside of ourselves. And if our focus is outside of ourselves, what is it that we're doing? We are putting ourselves into the temporary world of creation. We are putting ourselves into that which has no permanence. We're putting ourselves into that which disappears. So we either align ourselves with that which is temporary, that which is illusionary, that which has a short period of time, or we align ourselves with eternity, which has no time. Sufism is an attempt to align ourselves with eternity, to align ourselves with that portion of existence that is timeless and not subject to the variations of dissipation because of time, not subject to disappearing because of the damage that time does to things. Watch the world. Watch as time goes by in the world. What happens to everything 
as time goes by. Things get older, things decay, things disappear, things are forgotten, things no longer have the same kind of vigor or strength that they once had. If you build a house, a house after 200 years doesn't have the same kind of vitality that a house had when it was built. It needs to be refurbished. It needs to be redone. Uh, it may fall apart. What just happened in Florida is an example of how things have a time limit to them. And when that time limit ends, they fall apart. They come crashing down. This is what happens in the world. Things come crashing down. You've all seen digs where archeologists go layer by layer by layer into the earth and find various civilizations, one layer deep, two layer deeps, three layer deeps, seven layer deeps from 1400, 1800, 2000 years ago. This is the nature of this worldly <coughs> existence. We need to make a commitment to turn away from this worldly existence. We need to make a commitment to turn towards that which is eternal. That which is eternal doesn't have time. That which is eternal isn't subject to dissipation the way that things are that are subject to time are. Allah has created man so that man can enter into this eternal space. God is light. Man can become that light and enter into God's light and merge with him. This is the path that the prophets came to talk about. Religions began to try and engineer domestic policy. Religions came along to try and control man and keep him in place so that the ruling entities at the time could go on and have power. Religion and governments are not necessarily meant to be one and the same thing. Ruling the world and God's kingdom are two different things. Remember, Jesus said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. He made the distinction between the world and God's kingdom. He separated our allegiance to the two of them and explained to us that our allegiance to one and our allegiance to the other were different things. We have obligations to the world and we have obligations in the world, but these obligations to the world are not the same as our obligations to Allah. They're not the same as our obligations to, to ourselves so that we can enter into God's kingdom. And this all begins with getting to know yourself and getting to know the truth about God. Now, everyone says, well, how can we know him? What is it that has to be done so that we can hear him? How can we see him? How can we engage with him? Bawa gave a, a short answer to that. 
And he said, if you can be rid of the I, you can become to know him. So essentially, what's being explained is that what separates us from our Lord, what separates us from knowing the truth, what separates us from reality is this I that is attached to this physical world and attached to this body and believes in its own eternal existence. It believes that big lie, that there's no end to its existence. Because this self cannot see a world without itself in it, cannot see existence without itself in it, it refuses to acknowledge the fact that it will disappear. There was a man once uh, whose name was Gurdjieff, and he wrote a book called Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson. And at the end of the book, uh, after he has described all the foibles of mankind, uh, the, the grandson asked Beelzebub, how can man turn this world around? How can he finally come to the truth? And the answer was, when man is capable of seeing his own death and the death of everything around him, he'll begin to change. Well, man doesn't seem to be able to do that. Man doesn't seem to be able to grab that reality and hold on to it because it's too much for man to bear. And that's why prophets were sent to explain this over and over. That's why the Ketubs were sent to explain this over and over. That's why the saints were sent to explain this over and over and over. They did not fear death. They saw the continuum as it is. They could see what we cannot see. And they said to us, even though you can't see it, it's so. And if you believe in me, you'll be able, through your faith, to eventually understand this if you can focus on the reality of that. And here are the things you have to do in order to be able to do that. And then they explained life and how life should be lived. And that's what Shariat, Tariqat, Hakikat, and Marifat are about. It's about how your life should be lived to go from illusion to reality, to go from a body that dissipates, a body that falls apart to a being that slides through this world into the next world, that goes from illusion into reality, that goes from elemental to light without interference and without being stopped because of our faith and our understanding in the truth and the fact that we have let go of everything that isn't real. So what is real and what isn't real? God's qualities are real. Everything else is an illusion. God's qualities have eternity to them. Everything else is temporary. So we have to take stock of our own being. How much of our being is real and how much of our being is temporary? When we talk about praying to idols as opposed to praying to God, what are we really saying? that we're giving our allegiance to that which is temporary 
as opposed to giving our allegiance to that which is eternal. Everything in this world that we hold sacred is blocking us from understanding the truth of our creator and the truth of reality. So our allegiance to gold, our allegiance to women, our allegiance to men, our allegiance to fame, our allegiance to wealth, our allegiance to all of these desires within the world separate us from God. Desire, desire, think about that word. It means a magnetic attachment towards something within the world that you're trying to bring towards you. And as long as you are in this push and pull with the world, trying to bring the world to you, you are pushing the truth away from you. So one of the major things that separates us from truth is desire. And we have to understand that. So is it possible to sit still, relax, be at ease, be at peace, and be content and not want anything? To wait for the truth to rest on you so that you can see it within yourself? To allow the self-recognition of reality inside of you without any attachment to what's outside of you? Can we turn inwardly and let go of everything outwardly? Can we do that? Well, whether we can do that or not is the answer to the question of, is there reality for us? <laughs> is there eternity for us? Are we going to meet our creator and know the truth. We can't hold on to the world and find God. We have to let go of the world to find God. And we have to find a way that we can do this. And if we can't find that way, then we are creating our own doom. We are creating our own difficulties. We are creating the, the, the things that trap us from finding the truth. We all hold our destiny in our hands and we all choose whether we are interested in a destiny in this illusory world or we're interested in a destiny in reality, in a destiny with God. So as long as we're worried about the small things in this life, if we're worried about money, if we're worried about stress, if we're worried about what other people think of us, if we're worried about praise and blame, we're occupied with the world. We have to make our occupation the search for truth, the search for our creator, the search to understand God's qualities. And then we have to bring those qualities into our being. And as we refine ourselves, as we become closer to truth, we set the path for us that Allah wants us to set. And then Allah will come and help us continue on this path and take us closer and closer towards him. This is our prayer. This is the object of our life. This is our intention to find the way out of this jungle of illusion to enter into the tranquility and the peace and the contentment of reality. May that place come for each of us. 
May we all understand the truth of Allah's way and the way to find that truth. May we all understand Allah's gracious qualities and Allah's gracious names, and may they become who we are. May we all be able to say Anul Haq, because we have let go of the world and we have found the truth. Amin, Amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.